Well, good evening. Good to see you tonight. Is it good to be seen? Must not be. That's all I can say. It's good to be seen tonight. It's good to be here. How many of you need your midweek lift? I do. Badly. I had to go back to school this week, so I'm kind of one step behind at the moment. But I'll get caught up. Let's stand as we worship together as we sing, Oh, Praise the Name. Lift your voice to the Lord tonight. Amen. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed, a heavy stone, Messiah still, and all along. Let's lift him up. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise
Well, good evening. It's good to see y'all tonight. Here's what we're going to do. Do something a little bit different. We're going to have three praises tonight. And uh, I'm going to give the first one. And uh, so uh, here's the first one. And I, I don't know if I had told y'all this, but y'all know that the, uh, the group that we went to visit with there in Kentucky, we had a chance to um, minister to a family that had lost everything in their house. We, I showed y'all some pictures of that. Uh, the, the father of the house ended up coming to profess Christ as his Lord and his Savior. And so a great there. And uh, we are going back to see them um, on Labor Day weekend. I don't think I'll be able to do that. But um, you as a church family gave $1,000 to help. And it will be going towards that person. And I have put an order in to find out. We're going to get some bed sheets and things like that. But um, we are going to get a help. I mean, uh, uh, the ability to be able to go and to help that family. And a lot to be done there. I mean, if you were to look at the, the, it was a total loss for everything in their home. Everything is going to have to be replaced and stuff like that. So I, I give that as a praise that in, the, in our attempts to go up there and minister in the name of Jesus, this man gave his life to Christ. And we want to continue to follow through with that. And so with that being said, if you want to give towards that, um, you can just put it towards the disaster relief. And we've got a special fund for that, and we will make sure that it gets to where it needs to go. But just a, a praise on that. Two more praises. Somebody want to stand up and give a praise tonight? God's done something good, or you're just happy about something? Or as good as God is, nobody can get up and say anything. Only one week. Okay, so Caton gives that as a praise, and Jacob gives it as a prayer request. <laughs> Nine weeks with her husband. All right, that's her prayer request. <laughs> uh, so next Wednesday. Possibly Tuesday. All right. Well, we're going to, that is a, that is a praise, but we're going to be praying about that too. All right. Thank you, Kate. You got one more? I got it. Go All right. This, we started school this week and I went to choir yesterday and I went. And there was very few students there. Because of schedules and other things, I had several students go different directions. So this morning, I just said, Father, I know you're in control. I said, but I would love to have two more students. Today I got two more students. Well, amen. God answers prayers. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for this time that we have here tonight. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne of grace, we do give you praise for you are worthy of it. We thank you for your blessings of life for how you have watched over us in so many ways, Lord, for this, the niece family up in Kentucky, Lord. I, I thank you for, um, I believe his name is Ray, Lord. I can't remember his first name, but um, I thank you for the profession of faith that he has made, and I, I would pray, oh God, that you will help us as we seek to continue to minister, Lord, to help him to grow in his faith. Lord, I, I lift up Kate to you. I just rejoice with her and Jacob. Lord, and just uh, this brand new little baby that's coming, Lord, we pray that everything will be fine, and uh, we look forward, Lord. Next Wednesday, Lord, we want to be able to just come and to rejoice with them over the birth of their brand new little girl, and we just pray, Lord, that she will be healthy, Lord, that you will help her to grow in your grace, and Lord, tonight from this pulpit, I just want to pray for the day of her salvation. When she comes to that time of understanding, I pray that you will draw her and that she will surrender her little heart to you. Lord, I thank you for the praise that David has given, Lord, and just pray that as he ministers to those young people there, Lord, many of them are going to be going and serving in our churches, and I pray, dear God, that they will just get a passion for worship, Lord, a passion for you, and uh, Lord, that you will give David the wisdom and guidance as he leads them to worship that is honorable before your throne. But we thank you for this time that we can come tonight. We pray that you will continue to bless the worship service. Lord, we pray that you will bless the time of teaching. And to you be all the glory and the honor and the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, for our visitation, let me uh, thank you. All right, so our visitation, it turned out great. And I will tell you, I know that we had two people on the visitation team that went Monday night. I don't know about everybody, but I do know of two. I know the one that went with me had never been out on a visitation before. And so um, we had two that went out on visitation. We had some great visits made. Now, I don't know the report on all of them. Robert, did you have any special report about any of the visits? Awesome. 
Awesome. And so if uh, this week, not I me mean Monday, if you're on my team, which you'll be getting a phone call, my team is going out this week. And so it did. It went fantastic. Um, just it was a real praise. And I think that we're seeing something started within the life of our church that is going to have tremendous, tremendous impact. So uh, praise God for that. All right. I heard somebody else say something. Fran. Do you know his name? Stephen Edward Rogers. Oh, my heavens. It just Did anybody know him? Let's have special prayer for that family. Lord, I just want to come before you now, Lord. We pray for this young man's family. Lord, we don't know all the circumstances. Lord, we just know that he has been tragically killed. We pray for this family and ask that you give them your grace and mercy during this time. And uh, Lord, I would just pray that whatever this family, I don't know if they're churched, unchurched, or anything like that, but I pray, dear God, that there will be the opportunity to go in and to minister to this family. But Lord, with such a tragedy, Lord, I know that people are hurting, but Lord, you... Lord, you're so powerful in helping to heal our hurts. And so, Lord, we, we just pray for your touch on this family now, that you will watch over them as they go through this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that, Fran, letting us know. All right, David. Let's stand as we worship.
Stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice, a thousand generations. See, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and on that day we join the resurrection. So let it be today we shout the hymn of heaven. With angels and the saints, we raise a mighty roar. I don't know what a mighty roar is, but I can't wait till we do. I can't wait to participate in that mighty roar. Amen? Pastor. Hmm. All right. 
I would do a mighty roar right now, but I don't think it would be worthy enough. So I'll, I'll refrain from roaring. All right. Everybody good? Okay. Yes. Yes. How to share the gospel. All right. And, and let me say this, for all of those who are in our um, visitation, this would be a great thing. Anybody is welcome to this, but if, particularly if you are part of our visitation and outreach, um, this would be a really good thing. We've had, um, I think we've got roughly about 50 people who have signed up for our visitation and outreach, and that is a really good number. We've got five teams that will be going out uh, every week as we go in to share in our community. So that will be this Sunday at 5.30. Okay. Um, so let me tell you, before we, um, kind of an introduction. Um, I like looking at the news on my phone. Uh, I've got the Fox News app, and one of the things that it said on there was that um, there in Texas, there was a school district in Texas, and here was the headline, that they were reviewing a number of books to be banned in the library. Um, guess which one of the books was in under consideration? The Bible. All right. So now what the school district said was, we don't have a plan to ban the Bible. What's happened is, anytime somebody makes a complaint, they've got a review process where they'll review it and decide what they're going to do. But I looked at that, and there were year, there was years ago that when I would have read something like that, it would have just fired me up. And here's what I thought about. Oh, my goodness, do you really think you're going to ban the Bible? The Dublin Fire Department would have a better chance of threatening to put out the sun with a water hose than you will at banning the Bible. Um, in fact, I would say this. Laziness on our part, has kept more people from reading the Bible than any government ever has. Are y'all following me? The, the, the greatest problem is not our government. The greatest problem is our own laziness at times. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, I responded like this, and I do respond sometimes on these things. Um, but I said, you know, you can, I think this is what I said, you can try to ban it, you can try to burn it, and you can try to bury it, but you will not destroy it. And then I said, ask Voltaire. If you know who he was, he was the French atheist who said that he was going to basically destroy the Bible. I don't remember what his quote was. And uh, we were discussing in um, uh, uh, doing actually some uh, witnessing techniques in our men's Bible study on Sunday night. And I brought up the fact that Voltaire said he would destroy the Bible. And after his death, does anybody know what they did with his house? They turned it into a place where they distributed Bibles. So a Bible society literally bought his home, the great atheist Voltaire. And I think that God was just demonstrating his sense of humor in that. But the fact is, the Word of God is very powerful it, it, you know, these threats, we're going to ban the Bible and stuff like that. Many have sought to destroy the Bible, and they have been destroyed in their attempt to destroy the Bible. And so what I want to do, I had actually looked at, there was a Bible study that I had seen that I thought was really, really good. I had never seen anything quite like this before. But um, how many of you know what a metaphor is? A metaphor is something that kind of we use to describe something else. Y'all, real quick, give me some of the metaphors the way the, the Bible describes itself. How, what is it compared to? Bread. Yes, it is. And that'll be one that we'll look at next week. I, I don't have time to go through all 12 of them because David has reminded me that they've got choir practice tonight. So I'm going to have to cut it in half. But bread is one. And it's a sword. Life. What else? Truth. All right, well, I got a few that I'm going to give you tonight. And I, really, I thought it was a, when I looked at this thing, I saw, I thought, this is kind of neat. I've never seen anybody really kind of do this as a, as a Bible study. And uh, maybe you have, and if you have, um, that's great. There was actually 12 that it gave in this Bible study. And so um, 
for sake of time, I'm going to go through six of them, or maybe five, depending on if I can if I can do it. David doesn't think that I can get done by 6:30. I'm 7:30, but I I'm going to prove him wrong tonight. So um, all right, so I've entitled this the Mighty Word of God, and here's what I want you to do. We're going to be we're going to kind of use our creative imagination. And there's a reason. Y'all know when Jesus, when he taught, he taught using parables. And one of the beauties of Jesus teaching with parables is it it made you use your imagination. And Jesus kind of, he opened up windows so that we could peer into the truth of God's word through the parables. And And I believe that one thing that God does, if we just simply said it was the Bible, well, I mean, you understand how powerful it is. But then God, in his genius, just begins to make descriptions of the Bible so that you can kind of think about it in such ways. And I really do think that it stirs our heart as we consider each of these things. So here's what I want you to do as we go through this. I want you to write it down and kind of use this as your own personal Bible study. Um, you, can, you, can, um, for, you can just go and Google stuff and you can find more scriptures. Obviously, we're not going to be exhaustive tonight as we look at some of these things. But um, here's the first one that I got. Um, that your Bible is like a sword. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the Bible says, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so uh, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 and so the I, I want you to get that picture of your Bible as a sword um, and and let's use our imagination as we consider this and and look at God's Word and 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 try to think about because again I want you to see how incredibly powerful God's Word is and as we walk out of here tonight knowing that we we each have a copy of God's Word and how incredibly powerful it is. And we don't have to worry when somebody says, we're going to ban the Bible. They're not going to be able to do that. Can they? Theoretically. But practically, it'll crush them. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when the Bible says here that the Word of God is living and powerful, we don't, when I have the privilege to preach the Word of God, I'm not preaching from a dead, archaic book. I am preaching from a living Word, God's Word. It's powerful and it, don't you love the language here? It doesn't say that it is as sharp as a two-edged sword. You notice what it says? It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So the reality is this is greater than a sword. And, and how does a two-edged sword cut? It cuts both ways. And when you look at God's Word, I think about how it cuts both ways. So think about it like this. So as a, what the sword, the, 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 the Bible as a sword, here's one thing that it can do. It can pierce the heart. It can speak to us. Um, now we know that as believers that the Word of God is powerful and that it speaks to us. But the fact is, and as we were talking about this in our, our witnessing, um, what if you're witnessing to somebody and they say they don't believe the Bible? Still use it. Why? Because it's like a sword. It'll pierce the heart. It speaks to us. Use the word. Listen, when you're trying to to witness to someone, share the word. It it is very powerful and it can pierce the heart. And and here's the thing. You think about this, and I'm going to use kind of a different analogy of what the Scripture is saying here. But the Bible says that it's it's sharper than a two-edged sword. That means that it cuts. When you think about a surgeon and a surgeon using a scalpel to cut, that surgeon who goes in because he's trying to, to do something, maybe to remove a cancer or, or, or a tumor or something like that, that, that a, a surgeon can use something sharp in order to go in and to do what? To heal. How many of you have ever experienced 
the healing power of God's Word, as it ministered to your heart during great times of trouble. And so it's powerful. Um, here's another thing that I, I think of whenever I think about it as a sword. Uh, how did they use a sword back in the day? I mean, they used it. did they not use it against the enemy? And they could attack the enemy. It could defend against the enemy. We need to realize this, that when the, the enemy that we're facing today is very real. Satan is very real. He is our primary enemy. Now, he may use others. How do we, how do we fight the enemy? Through prayer and through the Word. And, and let me caution you in this. Don't get the idea that the way we're going to, as Christians, defend Christianity is going to be through logic. Now, is I, am I saying that the Bible is not logical? I think the Bible is very logical. But I'm talking about logic in a sense of, of trying to argue. Philosophy. We're seeing a lot of Christians who want to use philosophy in order to try to, to defend Christianity. Folks, listen. God gave us something that's very powerful and it's called His Word. And so if we learn to wield the sword of God, I promise you, it's very powerful. So I want you to think that as Scripture refers to itself, it calls itself a sword. And you need to be proficient in using this sword called the Bible. Here's the second way that Scripture gives us um, it, a metaphor that is used, and it's like a mirror. Look with me in James chapter 1 and verse 23. James chapter 1 and verse 23. And here's what James says. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. And he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Now what is James talking about here? My question for you is this, why do you look in the mirror? I'm going to give you the, the plain answer. We look in the mirror to correct the ugly, do we not? We got to fix the ugly, the hair's not right. Man, I'm looking rough. I look in the mirror to correct the ugly. Now what happens if you look in that mirror and don't correct the ugly when you're looking at it? You'll walk away and do what? You'll forget how ugly you are. If you're not looking at it, and, and here is what, here's what James is saying. Do you know what Scripture does when you read it? It shows you the ugly. It shows you how bad you are. Now, when it shows you how ugly you are, this is what James is saying here. Um, for if anyone is a hearer of the word, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it or hearing it. In their day, they were a, an oral society. Not everyone had the ability to read it the way that we do. But in the hearing of it, it was a mirror. And so when they heard the word of God, it revealed their sin. It revealed what was wrong with them. But he, uh, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, you're deceiving yourselves. And so the point that he was making here is, when you were revealed what you were, guess what you were supposed to do? You need to do something about it. Don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. When scripture reveals something to you, you need to act on it. What happens if you don't act on it? Look what he says. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And so there's an important lesson here when we think about the mirror. I mean, even right now as, as we are proclaiming God's word on Sunday mornings when the word of God is proclaimed, you're getting a mirror in front of you, and then right after the sermon is done, what do we have? I mean, right after the sermon is done, I'll pray, and what do we go into? Not lunch, before that. The invitation time. Now, we call it an invitation. I like to call it this, the time of decision. 
why do we like to call it, or why do, the reason I like to call it the time of decision is this. Because you have just been, um, uh, the Word of God has been put before your face like a mirror, and something has been revealed to you, and at that moment you need to make a decision. And, and, and what's happening is, how many of you have ever had that happen? You've been in church, you knew that God was speaking to you, and you didn't do anything about it. We, I've been there. And you know what happens? I walk out that door, and the conviction leaves me. I forgot what it was that God had even shown me. So this is why I'm telling you, it is so incredibly important that when, whether it's a, when, when you're having a devotion time, when, when, if you're riding down the road and you're listening to a, a preacher on the, the radio, or if you're just having a conversation with one of your friends, it doesn't have to be at the, in the church. Anytime that you are confronted with the Word of God and it serves as a mirror to show you something in your life, James says you need to go ahead and deal with it. Because if you do not, you're going to forget all about what God had shown you. That's what he's saying here in James. So the Word of God serves as a mirror to our lives. When you're looking in that mirror, it's there to correct the ugly. Don't walk away or you will forget how ugly you are. All right, next one here. Your Bible is a sword. Your Bible is a mirror. And your Bible is like a fire. Did y'all know that? Uh, look with me in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. And you may not know what Jeremiah chapter 29, 20, chapter 20 and verse 9 says, but whenever I read it to you, you're going to say, oh, I've heard that before. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. Jeremiah's writing here, and here's what he says. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more his name. Here's Jeremiah. Jeremiah's ministry was not going well. It, how many of you have ever known a preacher? Raise your hand. Every hand in this building ought to be raised right now. <laughs> how many of you have ever had a relative as a preacher? How many of you have ever had a son as a preacher? Anybody? Okay, listen. If you have a relative as a preacher, do you know how many times preachers want to quit? They want to quit, huh? Every Monday is resignation day. And then we get reassigned on Tuesday. <laughs> Gosh, it can be difficult work. Jeremiah experienced this. And here's what Jeremiah said. That, so you get this. Jeremiah is discouraged. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more his name. Here's what Jeremiah was saying. And now when you think about this, we think of all the great prophets, and Jeremiah is one of the greatest ones. Do you see what he's doing here? He's saying, I quit. I'm done with this. This bunch of stiff-necked people, I'm done with them. All they do is complain. They're never happy. They're disobedient. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of the complaints. I'm tired of them thinking that I'm some horrible individual. I'm done with them. You think all the, the great men of God just walked on a cloud all day long, and I'm telling you, more often times than, they not, than not, they walk through the valley rather than walking on top of the mountain. That was just the way that it was for them. But then Jeremiah says this. I love this. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back and I could not. I love that. I, here's the thing the word of God was much greater in Jeremiah's soul than was his discouragement let me tell you something one of the the great remedies for discouragement is the word of God and Jeremiah here it is I'm done I'm quit but the word of God began to well up in him it was like that fire and he says I can't hold it in this thing's got to go out. Now think about that metaphor as a fire. What does a fire do? It burns. Um, look with me 
in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 9. No, I'm sorry, verse 29. And the Lord says this, Is not my word like a fire? And the answer to that is absolutely it is. A fire burns. It consumes. It's powerful. Have you ever seen these wildfires? And that's what we call it a wildfire. What does a wildfire do? You, you can't control it. When the word of God as a fire begins to spread. That's why I don't worry about somebody saying, Oh, we're going to ban the Bible. Like you're going to control that. But here's the amazing thing. Go watch what happens when a wildfire gets set up, starts burning. We see it a lot in California. And it, it will burn literally tens of thousands of acres. It consumes everything. It is so incredibly powerful. And we've got guys out there, and they're doing everything they can to contain the fire. And you know what they're doing? They're praying for rain. They're praying for something that, that, because it's fire, they can't control it. And so it's consuming. You ever felt like you've been consumed by the Word of God? I mean, you're just sitting there, and as you're reading it, and the, and the Word of God is so powerful that it consumes you. You feel the power of God's Word. And, and what Jeremiah says here, and I think this is really really interesting that for Jeremiah I want you to again get the picture here for Jeremiah the word of God created a holy unrest in his soul God this is I, I, I can't not I, I can't just sit here I've got to go and tell people when the word of God gets into you you will have a desire to spread it now let me say this as the Word of God is consuming, we think about the destructive force of fire. But I want you to think about this. What happens when a, um, when a fire burns through a forest? What? The regrowth, the regeneration. It, it, it's amazing. It has the power to burn away all the dead stuff. And listen to this. To get rid of the dead stuff and make way for something new to grow. So when the Word of God hits you, that powerful, all-consuming fire that it is, and it can, it can hit you and bowl you over, but it has a way of getting rid of the dead wood and for new growth to come. And, and listen, all you got to do is just, <laughs> let's just set this thing and watch it burn. The, the, the metaphor here is that your Bible is like a fire. Here's another one. Staying right there in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 9. Your Bible is like a hammer. Look what he says here. Verse 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord? Yes, we just looked at that. And like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. So when we think of a hammer... A hammer has the ability to build up or to tear down. And, and see, when you respond to the teaching of Scripture, so when, when you're reading the Scripture that, that is a hammer, now, again, there's two ways that this thing can go here. When you are reading Scripture and applying it to your life, just like a hammer can be used to help to build a house, the Word of God can be helped to be used to, to build you up. But I think the point that he is making here is that a hammer will do what? It breaks rocks into pieces. What do we do with the Bible? Did you know that the Bible, if we use it, it has the power to, to, to literally just smash lives. You take God's word as a hammer, and you take it to a lie, it'll smash the lie. It can break things into pieces. When, when Satan believes that he's going to, to raise up his army and to defeat us as believers... We've got the Word of God, and it smashes rocks into little pieces. Those rocks cannot withstand the power of God's Word. It's like a hammer. So when you, when you start thinking about that metaphor that your Word of God, we always think about it as the sword, but how many of you have ever thought about it as the hammer? And it's powerful, and it can crush. So your Bible is like a hammer. Here's a, a fifth thing that your Bible is like. Your Bible is like water. 
Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. And look what Paul writes here in this verse. At verse 25, let me just start there so you'll see some context here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So there's that, that comparison there, the, the washing of water by the word. He's talking about our sanctification. Here, here's what the word of God does. The word of God helps to sanctify you. Um, I want you to think about this. When, when you get all dirty and filthy and grimy, what do you do? You take a shower or a bath. And it helps to remove the, the, all the, the dirt and the grime and the sweat and all those things from your life. When we talk about sanctification, I've, I've, I've shared this with you all before, in understanding the difference between sanctification and justification. Justification is that moment that you are declared righteous and you receive the righteousness of who? Christ. In justification, it is not a righteousness of your own. In sanctification, you are through the power of the Holy Spirit working out righteousness in your life. It's the way God begins to shape you and to mold you. And one of the powerful ways that that is done is through the Word of God. And so here James begins to, I mean, uh, Paul, he expresses it in that manner through the, the washing of water by the word. So I want you to picture this, that as you are reading the word of God and it begins to speak to you, the cleansing effect that we see is it helps us to deal with sin in our life. And as we put things away, we put off the old man and we're, we're pushing that stuff aside and and, and sanctification begins to happen in our life and we begin to look more like Christ and your Bible is like water and then it helps to do that. Another thing here, turn with me to Psalm 63 verse 1. Psalm 63 verse 1. Now... <clears throat> I'm going to kind of give a little bit of, <laughs> I, I guess you could say eisegesis here, but I think you'll be able to follow it. David's writing, he says, Oh God, you are my God, early I will seek you, for my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Okay, so David says that he thirsts for God like what? like water when we are thirsty by the way what what causes what causes thirst salt can cause thirst that's why you, you what is the old saying you can you can't make a horse drink water but you can give him a salt block <laughs> dehydration the, the number one cause of thirst is a lack of water. <laughs> and so when you don't have any water, you start thirsting. And David says, I'm, I'm thirsting for God. You don't know what's going on? All right. When we thirst for God, what is something that helps to quench that thirst? God's, God, I, I thought about a few things here. There's act, prayer, worship, and God's word. <laughs> And so with that, I'm making a comparison here that in that thirst, and the Bible has already compared what Paul says there in Ephesians 5, in verse 26, that comparing the comparison of the water to, work, to the Word, can I tell you that few things quench our thirst like Scripture does. And, 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 and another thing that it does is it has the power to refresh us. How many of you have ever gone a very long time without water? I mean a long time where you were like, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. I think I shared this illustration one time when I was in the Marines. We were having to do a, a force march and we were going and, and one of the water bulls, what they do in these big water tanks, 
they put the water in there and they put a little bit of bleach in there to kill the germs. A little bit of bleach. Whoever filled it up must have been the guy driving the truck because the guy driving the truck, that was the easy job. He must have filled up the water bowl and put way too much bleach because he wasn't going to need any water. We marched and marched and marched and we couldn't drink the water. I thought I was going to die. And I was so, and boy, the, the moment that we got something to drink, man, it was, it was wonderful. But what happens when you have been a long time without water? You become weak, you become dehydrated, your body doesn't function the way that it should, you can become delusional and delirious without water. And I want you to think about this. When we haven't drunk from the Word of God, did you know the same thing happens to us? We become weak spiritually, we become dehydrated spiritually. We can't function spiritually the way that we're supposed to. And, you know, we can become, I like this, we can become disillusioned. I think the people right now that are believers that are becoming so disillusioned and thinking, oh my gosh, what's happening? Well, read the Word of God. You won't be disillusioned. God's Word will tell you everything that's going on. You're like, wow, man, this is like reading today's paper. And so the Word of God is like water. And the more you drink it in, the greater it'll work out for you. All right, sixth thing here, and I'm going to make it, David. I'm going to make it. Your Bible is like seed. Look with me in Mark chapter 4, verse 3. Mark chapter 4 and verse 3. Here's what the... Uh, Jesus, you know this. It's the parable of the sower. I just want to read two verses. He says, listen, behold, a sower went out to do what? To sow. What's he sowing? Seed. Okay, look in verse 14. The sower sows the what? What does he call it here? The word. So the seed is what? Is the word. So you see the comparison. So all these metaphors that we've used, we've seen it's like a sword, it's like fire, it's like water. Now we're seeing that the word of God is like seed. When a seed is planted... What do you immediately notice? Any of you who plant gardens, when you plant that seed, what immediately do you notice? Here's the answer, nothing. <laughs> you put it in there, you cover it up, nothing. And, and if you didn't know any better, you'd say, well, goodness, why did I do that? This was useless. But what do you know about that seed? You got to give it some time. And so... Nothing happens, but listen to me. The power that is in the seed may not be immediately seen or felt. The Word of God is like seed. And you may, you may, be, try, you may be reading God's Word. How many of you have ever read God's Word and you walked away and you think, well, you know, that was, I did my devotion time and it's not a good devotion, but I, no, I, it was no Damascus Road. It didn't seem like much happened. Can I tell you, if a seed got planted into your heart, much happened. I, I, I have learned this as a pastor. Does it bother me when this thing does this all the time? <laughs> Hold on. I, I think I know what's happening here. And Satan, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I think it might be. Oh, yeah, I think you got it. All right. So what bothers me, or what doesn't bother me, where I was going with this, on a Sunday morning when I preach and nobody moves, I'm not discouraged. Here's what I know. If I have faithfully proclaimed God's word, you know what I have just done? I've just scattered seed. And it may not seem like anything has happened. I'm okay with that because I know the seed is powerful. You may not see it. You may not feel it. But when the word of God, when the seed is planted... It, something will happen. Now here's a question for you. What do you need to do with seed? Water it. What did we just compare one of the metaphors that we use for the Word of God? It's water. All right, so I want you to get this. When seed is planted in someone's heart or in, in your heart, and for a believer or an unbeliever, um, there's different ways to water that seed, and seed needs to be watered. The, 
the Bible serving as water, it can water the own seed. I want you to think about that as maybe that God has spoken to you and a seed has been planted in your heart. And the more you read God's word, that it might be in that moment acting like water, watering the seed. Watering can, can happen through mentoring as you take somebody and you begin to, to mentor them or to, to disciple them. I think that watering can come through fellowship for us as believers as God implants those seeds in our word through discipleship. I think that during a time of worship, a time of prayer, it is amazing how God can, can do all kinds of things to water the seed that is in our, in our heart. Now when the seed is, begins to grow forth whether it's a plant a tree or a bush what does it typically produce fruit and so the word of God is a seed and when it gets implanted into our heart as it begins to grow it will produce fruit now here's a question what happens if you plant more seeds you get more fruit the question is this how much fruit do you want produced in your life you want a little or a lot? Do you know how I can tell you to get much fruit in your life? Plant a lot of seeds. Immerse yourself into the Word of God. And as you immerse yourself into the Word of God, and all those seeds that are planted, God's going to take those seeds and He's going to bring forth much fruit in your life. I want to close with this. Your Bible that you have, don't take it for granted. Like I told you to begin with, laziness has done more to keep people from reading the Word of God than any government ever has. Don't let laziness keep you from one of the greatest blessings of this life. Y'all know what the Bible has been described as? God's love letter to us. God telling us how much He absolutely loves us. So there's a few metaphors about the mighty Word of God. I gave you six. Next Wednesday, I'm going to give you six more. But as you take the Word of God, you remember how powerful it is and let God use it greatly in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for giving it to us. And to our shame, Lord, we have to say forgive us for not reading it as we should and oftentimes not applying it as we should. Convict our hearts tonight, Lord. I pray that that seeds will be planted. I pray, Lord, that it will bring forth much fruit. And in that fruit that is planted, to you be the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you all. It is 730. I did it, David.